We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. How great it is that we have a planet-sized neighbor within three days of reach so we can test all this stuff so that the Mars colonists can go to Mars with, with vehicles and HABs that have had analogs tested on the moon and they know that they're going to work. I think that uh, making the commitment for the U.S. to lead international crews within two decades to land on Mars is enough to get done by on uh, the 50th anniversary of a national holiday on July 20th in 2019. If we can get that across, then we can, we can build up the details of exactly how and what we do after we land, what we lead toward. Do we visit, do we occupy, or do we inhabit? Project Legacy is the proving ground for the future colonization of Mars. You have to learn how to walk before you can run. What we have done is we have designed a moon base capable of sustaining two-year missions with a maximum crew of eight. Project Legacy explores many of the big issues facing the prospect of Mars colonization. How do you grow and sustain proper food supply on another planet? How do you protect astronauts from dangerous levels of radiation? How do you get resources, such as water, out of the surface of the Moon and Mars? A lot of people think that the hard part about colonizing Mars is getting there. That is a big issue, but more importantly is how do you survive once you get there? Project Legacy answers this question. The Project Legacy base will be located near Cavius, a crater at the South Pole on the near side of the Moon. Three groups of three habitat modules will be on the northern end of the crater. It will be crewed by up to eight crew members supported by in-situ resource utilization. The crew members will be on the moon for a maximum of up to two years until the next crew arrives. Mining will occur in the PSR or permanently shadowed region 14 kilometers south of the base. Processing of extracted resources will occur near the mining site. A refueling depot will be established outside of the crater near the reusable lander landing zone. To construct our base, we first need to move massive amounts of rock and regolith. To do this, we'll impact the surface, forming craters in which we will later place our halves. These impactors will be aluminum spheres and they'll be delivered to the moon aboard a multiple impact vehicle. Approximately 60 seconds before impact, 
this multiple impact vehicle will separate into three separate vehicles. These vehicles will then communicate and coordinate with one another to impact the moon simultaneously, traveling approximately 4.6 kilometers per second. These impacts will move roughly 5,000 tons of regolith and will save us over 100 days of construction. The base is constructed from nine connected habitat modules. Each habitat module will be landed by a separate cargo lander a short distance from the impact craters. Once on the ground, a modified version of JPL's athlete will remove the habitat modules from the cargo lander and deliver them to the craters. Once in the craters, partial sections of the radiation shielding will be constructed around them to prevent damage from high velocity debris. Once all, once all the modules are landed and the shielding is completed, the base will be suitable for habitation. Our method of radiation shielding consists of burying the bottom floor of the halves, covering the rest of the halves with bags of regolith, and storing 12 centimeters of water at tanks at the top floor of each half. This combination of radiation shielding provides us with the most efficient design that will protect the crew members against galactic cosmic rays, solar particle events, and solar wind. The third floor of the living hab is a common area for the crew members to share. It is used for social activities to combat the stressful environment of living on the moon. The bottom floor of each living hab contains personal quarters for the crew members to sleep and store their items. The majority of the meals that the crew members will be eating will be grown using aeroponics technology. We have a total of 114 growing structures to provide each crew member with enough vegetables to eat for two meals each day. Um, in order to power our lunar base, we'll be bringing um, a SAFE 400 experimental nuclear reactor. Um, in order to meet our power requirements, we'll actually be bringing two SAFE 400 model reactors, as well as uh, two HOMER 15 model reactors in order uh, to use them for in-situ resource utilization. In order to support our reusable crewed lander vehicle, we'll be making liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen propellants uh, on the surface of the moon using two systems, the in-situ resource utilization device, or the ISRU, and the fuel depot. Um, the ISRU will be in the permanently shadowed region of Cavius Crater, where they, we are expecting to have lots of uh, crystal ice under about two meters of regolith and the ISRU will drill down under this two meters of regolith and sublimate the water out of the ice crystals. It'll then collect it in a tank and then condense it into liquid water uh, that we can then use. It's gonna take the liquid water to the fuel depot and at the fuel depot, uh, we'll be using the electrolysis process to separate the water into gaseous hydrogen and oxygen. And then we'll be using heat exchangers to condense those into liquids which we'll then use as the propellants for our reusable lander vehicle. The fairing landers are reusable manned lunar landers. By taking advantage of ice on the lunar surface, we will be able to refuel these landers with hydrogen and oxygen. When a crew arrives at the XM2, which is our lunar space station, one of the fairing landers will go up and meet them. The landers only spend a few days in orbit due to concerns about hydrogen bar law before coming back with the crew. In lunar orbit, we will place our exploration module, XM2. The XM2 will essentially be a small space station in orbit around the moon, in order to provide a waypoint for fairing astronauts to and from the lunar surface. The station is designed to dock with an Orion capsule, while simultaneously docking with one of our fairing landers. Also in orbit around the moon are three commsats. These commsats orbits are specifically designed to give constant coverage of the lunar base while maintaining a link with Earth. These satellites are capable of streaming HD footage back to Earth 24-7. On the surface, we will place four science probes that will measure seismic activity, internal structure, and local heat flow. These probes will be taking measurements to measure hazards such as moonquakes and to help us better understand their origin and how to mitigate their harmful effects. To safely travel from Earth to Mars, humans will rendezvous with an Earth-Mars cycler vehicle. This vehicle will provide all of the radiation shielding and life support that the astronauts need on their journey. The cycler is on an S1-L1 trajectory, which means that it passes by Earth and Mars regularly every synodic period. The hyperbolic rendezvous with the cycler at Earth is very risky because if something goes wrong, the crew may not be able to abort and return to Earth. To maximize the chance of mission success and crew survival, the rendezvous will occur in four stages. 
In 2035, the Ferry to Mars Cycler, or FEMAC, will be launched into low Earth orbit. From here, it will be placed onto a highly elliptical orbit as the cycler approaches. Next, the FEMAC will be put onto a hyperbolic trajectory towards the cycler. After around two days, the FEMAC will perform a trajectory correction maneuver and then dock with the cycler. The design of the FEMAC incorporates the way of mitigating the risk of the hyper rendezvous with the cycler. It will be launched by SLS Block 2. The staging consists of exploration upper stage, booster stage, service module, and the crew capsule. While the booster stage alone is able to complete the mission, in the case of the booster failure, the service module is capable of providing extra delta V to continue and complete the rendezvous. Or it can be used for the safe crew return to Earth. This design ensures the crew safety and is able to send crews to the cycler and to Mars. Once the crew is on board the cycler, they will begin their journey to Mars. After spending around 140 days in deep space, they will become the first men and women to set foot on another planet. The real benefit of Project Legacy is that if you are going to, dis to decide or discover the best way to solve a lot of these issues that you have when you try and live on another, another planet, the best way to do it is try and do it before you go to that other planet. And luckily for us, we have a moon which is about three days away where you want to learn from your mistakes there, learn from your successes there, before you ever have to go to Mars, which is well over six months away. So Project Legacy offers all of these different solutions to these huge issues when, it, when the question is posed, how do you survive? How do you survive on another planet? Studying the moon is our best bet for understanding what the Earth was like in its infancy. Um, and in fact, much of what we've learned about the early solar system and about the early Earth comes from the samples brought back by the Apollo and the Luna missions in the 1960s. So I, I firmly believe that uh, any new uh, mission uh, to the Moon or to Mars is going to open up fields that we don't even, we only scratch the surface of. Understanding this early history of the solar system, this early history of, of Earth, the origin story of life, um, those are the those are the kind of things that we can really only get to uh, by going to the moon, by going to Mars. Uh, and once we have humans there in a large scale uh, infrastructure and a science program um, dedicated to, to doing that kind of in-depth analysis in multiple locations, uh, on multiple bodies, are we going to really learn about our own origins? And the place to do that is on the moon. The moon is a three-day trip out and a three-day trip coming back. We don't want to be learning about these things at Mars with a six month trip going out, 500 days to wait for the planets to realign, and another six months to come back. I think we'll move to a different era where it'll be a natural thing to have humans living on the Earth, living on the Moon, living on Mars, doing what people do. What it comes down to really is will. If we as a nation want to explore space and to establish permanent uh, presence on the moon and on Mars. We can do it. We certainly have, you know, we have enough uh, wealth. We have the technical knowledge. We have the people who want to do it. You know, all of those things are ready. And when we're ready to go and we've decided that we want to do it, we can do it. If you could go to the moon, why can't you do this? It sets a goal and objective. Maybe impossible? Many thought it was impossible. What we're talking about now can be considered impossible in, in uh, restricted budgetary conditions. So now it's a question of where do you want America to be? Do you want it to be what we can get done with a half a percent? I don't think so. But you have to leave that somehow up to the people. Otherwise, the Congress won't see to it that they fund the, the proper things. So that means educating the people. What did we do in the past successively? Really drill that into uh, what was achieved during these uh, Apollo golden legacies of legacies. So it's the Gemini missions and Apollo 
45 because Apollo 1 is one week after the uh, inauguration of the next president. So we, we need to take advantage of that and keep the public informed in, in what we did and what we plan to do so they see where it fits in.